Um, it's three o'clock in Central Europe, so welcome everybody. Let's start uh, our session. I think there will be still some people coming to join us, but um, we have a lot of things to do, so uh, we just want to start in time. My name is Jochen Guckes. I am in the German Bundestag responsible for parliamentary strengthening projects and one of your hosts today. Um, the idea to this session has been proposed by Jonathan Murphy, the head of program of Inter Paris, and the session concept has then been developed um, by the two of us and the rest of the team of Inter Paris. Unfortunately, Jonathan has been on extended medical leave for quite a long time. And now today, I'm very glad to have him as a participant here uh, with us. And um, therefore, I'd ask Jonathan to just briefly take the floor. Jonathan, thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jochen. And uh, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Um, uh, everybody, I'm really excited about this uh, event. As Jochen said, um, I was involved at the beginning in, in early discussions with Jochen uh, about this event and, and, and about highlighting and foregrounding uh, the role of parliaments in parliamentary strengthening. And, um, and I'm really pleased uh, how, uh, unfortunately, I, I had to uh, take some time off on medical leave and how Jochen and, and the team from Inter Paris and our collaborators, our speakers, have, uh, have come together to put, to put together what, what I think is, uh, is a super exciting session. So I'm really, really uh, pleased to have the opportunity to participate in the event. And, uh, and once again, I'd like to thank the speakers. I'd like to thank the participants. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Inter Paris and of course, Jochen. And back to you, Jochen. So thank you very much, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure and it's always, and uh, I hope that uh, all of us then will have a fruitful afternoon. Uh, you said that the team of Inter Paris uh, has been crucial for this session. So let me shortly introduce uh, all of them. Um, maybe you can just shortly wave or say hi on the screen. So first of all, there is Ingrid Walker, who is the acting head of program of Inter Paris now and uh, hosting the session together with me. Ingrid, can you wave? Hi, everyone. Perfect. Then we have Elena Botanina, who is administrative assistant at Inter Paris and has written most many of the emails to you. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Then, thirdly, we have Yulia Timoshik, who is joining from Ukraine today. So, one of the virtues of uh, virtual events. Hello there. Yulia is event organizer and consultant at Inter Paris. Furthermore, in the last weeks, we have been supported by Marie Batby, monitoring and reporting assistant at Inter Paris. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And finally, by Magda Labatze, another team member of Inter Paris. Hi, everyone. Good. So the, our plan today is to deliver at least a good practice of what is the state of art for video conferences. That is, we want to be as interactive and as varied as possible. And so please, as most of you do, um, put your cameras on, interactivity is really uh, living on seeing each other. If connectivity is good enough, um, that would be great, especially, of course, in the breakout rooms. Just a short word to the agenda today. Uh, we'll have a short conceptual introduction, then five presentations from roughly all over the world, interactive breaks, a well, other one interactive break, we'll explain that later, breakout sessions, and then to finish a general discussion. As most of you have seen, we record this event, um, just um, to be aware of this. And um, yeah, unfortunately, due to the many things we want to do with you, we have to be relatively brief and to the point because our hope in the event for the coffee break is scheduled 
fix at 4 p.m. So um, we'd rather start working. Ingrid, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jochen. Um, well, hello everyone once again. Um, it is such a pleasure to see you all gathered here today. Um, I really just wanted to take the opportunity to highlight in a bit more detail the, the broader framework in which our session is taking place today. Um, and in fact, this seminar is the first in a series of parliamentary development community of practice sessions initiated under the broader umbrella of the Agora Global Knowledge Platform on Parliamentary Development. So with the renewal of Agora in 2020, um, a small group of parliaments and implementers um, really saw the need for a global community of practice as a critical step in re-establishing parliamentary development as a key component of governance development work. And the community of practice, of course, is at the core, a network of counterparts sharing their experiences and learning from each other. Um, and uh, we really just aim to create the space for open and frank discussions, for knowledge sharing, and why not uh, defining and promoting good practice while providing an opportunity to discuss innovative work approaches. Um, so if you're interested in joining the community, We'd, we'd be delighted to have you with us. Don't hesitate to let us know. Um, and of course, we'd be extremely happy to have as many of you as possible involved. And we'll talk a bit uh, more about this um, later in our session. Um, but coming back to, to the session today, uh, we really just wanted to start with a short interactive um, icebreaker or warm up using Mentimeter, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, the, the tool has uh, quite a few options. We'll just share with you a few of them. Um, and uh, a first polling question will be just posted in the chat. Um, we basically just uh, want to capture where everyone is from. Um, so feel free to click on the link as it pops up in the chat. Um, and um, you don't have to be very precise where the pin goes if uh, the map on your screen turns out to be quite small, uh, but you can just uh, put the pin as close as possible to your location. Um, and uh, my colleague Yulia will share just in a few seconds um, the, the results. Uh, this is just an opportunity uh, for all of us to, uh, to really get to get to know each other um, and to find out where um, in the world we might be. Um, and I can see quite a, a strong European contingent. Probably this is because of our time zone today, um, but I'm sure that future sessions will be more dedicated to other regions in the world. Um, in, in any case, uh, I'm pleased to see uh, so many of you from, um, from so many different uh, um, areas uh, and regions. Um, I'll just allow a few more seconds for, uh, for a few more responses. Um, and after that, we'll, um, we'll move on. Um, we'll share the final results. Feel free to still respond. Uh, we'll share the final, we can share the final resp uh, responses again later. Um, but once again, welcome everyone um, from um, wherever you, you might be. And, uh, after this, we, we now want to uh, move ahead. Um, and we have one more question for you. This is also in Mentimeter, but it's, it's a bit different. Uh, the responses can be free form. Um, and of course, uh, we're now moving into uh, more closely into the topic of our session today. And we really wanted to, to find, find out from you um, what you think is needed most um, in the parliamentary strengthening community um, at the moment. Um, and um, you will have various options for responding there. Um, and uh, we, you will have a bit more time for, for responding to this question um, throughout uh, the next hour. And we will in fact come back to the results um, of this uh, for later in the session. Um, so thank you all so much. And I'll now pass the floor back to Jochen um, to talk to us a bit more about the themes that we'll be discussing today. Yeah, thank you, Ingrid. Um, there are three major points I want to make about the aim of today's session. The first one is to stress the role of parliaments as the part, 
uh, as a part of the community of practice that Ingrid has mentioned. Um, parliaments, besides, of course, implementers and donors. So there is a value of peer-to-peer -peer work by parliaments themselves, both by MPs and by staff. And we want to allow today for reflection about the role and the strength, uh, the strength of peer-to-peer -peer work uh, in this community and the opportunity or maybe the necessity to have a sort of own sub-network within the community. Of course, we are very happy to see many implementers and donors here today, as we always work together in our common projects. And so we are glad that you are interested in this um, endeavor as well. The second main point is to reflect what we have all learned to do during the last uh, couple of months, that is working digitally or hybrid, and to have a set of good practices that everybody can use without having to have much knowledge or money that everybody can use in everyday peer-to-peer -peer strengthening work. So there's two things to strengthen in this context. The first is being interactive. So we want all of you to participate and to be active participants. We have breakout sessions. We have the pollings we just started. We will work on interactive whiteboards because we believe that having active participants is really making this work better. The second point we want to try out today is uh, networking, which usually is better in uh, events on the ground where you have personal encounters, but we can do that virtually too. There are new opportunities for this. Some of you might have tried out Wonder Me, where you can uh, choose your own partner for a coffee break. Today, we will have another tool hop in, which allows for speed dating. So this speed dating is really interesting because you get to know other people you might not have met. Otherwise, you'll see this during our coffee break. The third major point, of course, is then content, the topics that are fundamental for our common work. And those topics will be covered by the five presentations we will have and then later on in the breakout sessions. You can have a look at the concept note we have still present at the website uh, where you can read which uh, topics we had in mind and what we are talking about. Now, we hope that this dialogue we are starting today is going to continue after today's session and that other parliaments will take up. We'll organize next sessions and there are quite a few topics out there, be it in our call or other um, topics. Uh, or even today's topics who might need some more in-depth um, discussions. So take up and uh, organize the next sessions. Now there's a final remark I wanted, uh, or I have to make, unfortunately. We wanted to send you a list of participants, but due to data protection regulation that is a little bit more complicated than it used to be uh, in the old days, we do need a written consent of all of you to be able to dress, dress up such a list. And so I'd like to ask you to fill out the evalu evaluation survey right at the end of our session. And once we get that back from you, we have that written consent and can send participants names and emails to everybody so that you can continue discussions among you. Now, enough from my side. Let's start with the real work. Ingrid, your turn. Thank you so much, Jochen. Um, we will basically now uh, move to our uh, speakers um, and we're really uh, looking forward to the presentations and case studies that will be presented today. Um, so I am delighted to now pass the floor to our first speaker of today, um, who is joining us all the way from Fiji. Um, Josua Namoche, um, the executive advisor to the Speaker of the Parliament of Fiji, um, but Josua worked as the manager um, of research and library services at the Parliament of Fiji between 2015 and 2020, and was uh, very closely involved in the setup and work of the Pacific Floating Budget Office, which we are looking forward to hearing about more today. I just also wanted to commend Josua for agreeing to join us at 3am Fiji time. 
Um, and I think we can all promise next time to meet the other way around. Um, so Joshua, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ingrid uh, and the team. Uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, you today or tonight. Uh, again, uh, good afternoon to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share with you uh, my experiences with the uh, Pacific uh, uh, floating uh, budget office. Um, I'll just share this the PowerPoint with with you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Okay, thank you. Um, the Pacific Floating Budget Office is actually a, a collaboration of uh, parliamentary researchers across uh, the Pacific. Uh, they join forces to come and build capacity and uh, to undertake uh, budget analysis in uh, Pacific parliaments where the capacity is needed. It's supported by UNDP and the participating parliaments and the researchers are drawn from around the Pacific, which is closer to home. And also from the UK uh, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, why the UK, why New Zealand, Australia? Because uh, we are part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. We share similar uh, parliamentary traditions and practices. So that's why we, we, we had them in. And the pilot was in Fiji in 2016. Uh, uh, primarily the uh, research uh, staff from the parliamentary library and uh, research services, uh, but we often get staff from other units within the various parliamentary services. Uh, the, the work, the office is facilitated by UNDP, of course, with uh, their donor partners, uh, donor countries, uh, particularly uh, Australia and New Zealand and the government of Japan. And uh, earlier on, the European Union uh, had supported the, the, the project. And uh, how do we do it? We actually go when uh, there is an assessment of the need for, for budget analysis assistance. So it's not uh, imposing anything on the host parliament. So we, it's a needs uh, basis um, approach. So the parliament has to make a request. Um, and it's often parliament with, uh, that are still developing. Uh, and are still developing their capacity, their staff. So the team is assembled from the various parliaments and uh, depending on the availability of researchers, so the parliament send uh, a staff to, to the team and then the team goes to the host parliament to do very uh, quick uh, budget analysis and, and also capacity building. They're called the uh, budget missions. Uh, this is the term that UNDP or the UN uses, uh, missions. So that's why we call it uh, a mission, a budget mission. Um, basically, there are three objectives to assist the host parliament uh, to provide easy to understand the information on budget uh, or national budget and the budget process and related issues. Secondly, to have a quick analysis, a rapid analysis of uh, the budget for MPs. And thirdly, to share knowledge and experience and uh, build capacity amongst the local staff and transfer skills and budget analysis um, from the participating team to the local host. Um, so what uh, does it involve? A lot of organization behind the scene, trying to get uh, um, the team uh, assembled. Uh, before the mission is uh, done, we prepare and collect a lot of information, documents um, ready. And then there's an organization of logistics, UNDP does all of that and uh, even the host parliament uh, and the participating parliament, they do all the, the organizing. And we plan on the mission, time, deliverable roles, etc. set deadlines, etc. So just a basic uh, process uh, to prepare for the project. Uh, how do we approach the budget analysis is uh, mostly from the development perspective, uh, you know, gender, climate change, uh, environment. However, uh, there's a consideration of the national priorities of the host, host country or the host parliament. So there's no imposition of what we're going to cover in the analysis. So it depends on the host parliament. And 
We also provide the, <coughs> excuse me, information on the budget process from pre-parliament to parliament and post-budget. And we have a workshop for members. Uh, we also have a workshop for CSOs, if time permits, then we do that. And uh, if they allow us to do it, and if there's time, if there's space. And also the workshop allows us to get uh, more intimate with the members. So there's a one-on-one Q&A &one, uh, sessions. Uh, we go through the budgets in detail and uh, we share with them uh, what the team has done. Uh, it's also an opportunity for face-to-face -face contact with the members. What are the benefits? Uh, the members of parliament actually get a, a much more uh, easy to technical jargon that's associated with financial uh, information and budgets. We provide a quick snapshot of the analysis, uh, a lot of infographics, simple language. Uh, uh, for your information, a lot of the parliaments we go to, their English is, is a second language. So we try our best to simplify things for the members. So we ensure that members are well armed. Often the the analysis is done before the budgets are debated in parliament. So we help uh, members, the information we provide helps members prepare themselves for the debate. And uh, also by having the budget, uh, floating budget mission, floating budget uh, office and the mission, uh, the members actually get a more neutral perspective on the budget uh, rather than having it from the executive or the government. And also it's also an opportunity for the new members of parliament to learn about the budget process from practitioners or from people who are involved in uh, parliamentary work. Uh, what are the benefits from staff? Uh, there's a lot of capacity building. Uh, a lot of the team members that go out are very experienced uh, from their respective parliaments. So they go out and uh, exchange ideas, transfer skills. Uh, but it's also it's a two-way uh, learning experience, so it's not just about the experts or the more experienced uh, parliamentary researchers imparting their knowledge. They also learn more about uh, what's happening in the host parliament, uh, the practices they do, the templates they use, uh, and also we one of the benefits of the floating budget mission is we develop this uh, informal network of. Uh, uh, parliamentary researchers, so we get into contact with them. I think uh, one of them is in the uh, is in this session, Hannah Johnson from the Wales uh, Assembly, uh, and it's a very good uh, example of peer-to-peer uh, -peer parliamentary strengthening. Of course, there are challenges, uh, conflicting schedules, uh, priorities uh, that make it difficult to convene teams. People are not available. Um, and also researchers are unfamiliar with each other. Remember, there are people who are coming together who haven't met each other and only met each other on email. So right off the, the airport into the hotel, into the parliament, um, we get to meet them. And they're very short timelines, a week or two weeks. Um, and they need to develop high quality groups for members of parliament. And also the non-availability or lack of capacity of local staff, that can be a hindrance to the mission. But again, that's the whole idea is to uh, build capacity amongst local staff. Uh, problems that we face is a uh, non-availability of source documents in the host country, and also the expectation of uh, members of parliament may conflict with the mission's uh, adherence to impartiality. So uh, we get members who pose very uh, 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 thought-provoking questions and more political questions rather than to do with the information that we're sharing. And also the researchers workload, uh, it's uh, very tight. You know, hotel, coffee rooms, restaurants, or you know, outside the hotel to try and uh, keep up with the timelines. Uh, again, we are assembling uh, a team from different countries, different cultures, people who haven't seen each other. So that's a, a challenge. And also the time for the overseas research team to understand the budget document format and the local process. Um, and it becomes a learning experience for a lot of them uh, that come from uh, the overseas countries to the host parliament. Uh, again, the budget documents are being unavailable and understanding local context and trying to maintain a neutral position. Mm, a lot of the Pacific countries are developing. Uh, a lot of them uh, still uh, adhere to a lot of traditional uh, ways of living, living culture. And of course, the competing priorities at the host parliament, uh, 
you know, we've encountered where we, the team has come in and then uh, there's something happening in the parliament uh, or it's just opening or there's a parliament sitting or something else is happening. And then the timings of the budget processes versus the availability of researchers. Uh, again, that's a challenge of uh, trying to uh, get together a team. Uh, we've had uh, budget uh, missions since 2016. Uh, the first one was in the Fiji parliament and we've had it uh, going on for a while now. Now, the whole idea is not to have it continue forever. Uh, this is a capacity building uh, uh, exchange and a peer-to-peer -peer capacity building uh, initiative. So we expect that uh, the host parliaments have developed enough skills and capacity to conduct their own budget mission. And then the whole idea was to reduce the, the number of uh, researchers or the, reduce the floating budget office uh, as uh, we progress. Um, We've had it in the Solomon Islands, Tonga, uh, PNG, Vanuatu. Uh, also, uh, since the pandemic, it's gone virtual. So everything has been done online uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, and it's been, a, and in fact, from uh, our experience, uh, doing it online has been quite fast. Uh, <laughs> we've been able to do it, do it much more quickly online <laughs> than uh, you know being there in person. So that's one of the benefits of the online uh, platform. I think basically that's uh, all, Vinaka, for your attention. And uh, that's all about a very quick uh, rundown on the uh, UNDP Pacific Floating Budget Office. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. That was incredibly interesting. And there are so many elements um, there to, to unpack and discuss from, uh, from the challenges that you highlighted, from the working modalities um, and so on. Our, our plan was to have a short Q&A after each presentation, but because we're running a bit short, please drop your questions in the chat. We'll come back to them later uh, in our discussions, both in the breakout rooms um, and also in the general discussion afterwards. Um, so thank you so much, Joshua, once again. Um, we'll, uh, we'll come back to this discussion uh, shortly. Um, and I would like to pass the floor now to our next uh, presenter, um, John Davis, who's the Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association UK uh, since 2017. Um, John had been with the UK Civil Service since 1990 um, in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and you can read more about John's vast international experience in the bio brief. I won't go into too much detail here as it would take us quite a bit of time. Uh, John will share more with us about parliamentary strengthening experiences from the Commonwealth. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. John, you have the floor. Ingrid, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's been involved with organizing uh, today's event. Uh, and thank you also to colleagues for uh, running the PowerPoint for me. Thank you very much for doing that too. Uh, it is very good to be part of this community uh, and uh, thank you for, for making this happen. So as Ingrid has said, I'm Chief Executive of the UK branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Josua from Fiji has actually already mentioned the uh, uh, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. I run the UK part of that uh, in the UK Parliament. Uh, good to have some colleagues from the UK Parliament online. Uh, we're not the overall headquarters secretariat, and I think also Cynthia from the secretariat and Matthew Selleck are both online as well. We are the UK part of that to make clear what we're not. But as you'll see from the next slide, uh, if possible, um, what we do do is what you all do as well, is we're trying to be about uh, strengthening parliamentary democracy. Uh, and that normally uh, is about creating opportunities for people of parliaments across the Commonwealth, very much including the UK Parliament, to come together and learn from each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. And over the last year and a half, that has meant virtually, obviously, uh, rather than in person. As well as that parliamentary strengthening uh, overarching ambition and aim, uh, we also have focused in recent years on five themes you can see there on the slide. So it's always about strengthening parliaments, but we've been looking particularly uh, at how parliaments scrutinise public, public finances, public funding, particularly through public accounts committees. We've been looking at trade, particularly from a UK point of view, as you can imagine, scrutiny of trade agreements, something this parliament is having to learn quite fast. Uh, we've looked at modern slavery in particular. I'll come on to that in a bit. 
uh, women in parliament is one of our other themes, both representation of women in parliament, but also issues related to that and also security. Most recently, we've been interpreting that in terms of climate security. So if I can move on to the next slide, I wanted to very quickly pin what I say to the various themes and topics which the organisers suggested. So the first is around uh, moving beyond the teacher student dynamic. I think particularly the UK feels this keenly uh, because of how we fit, if you will, within the Commonwealth. Uh, and it's particularly important for us. And the example I give you there is our work on modern slavery. Our work started when the UK Parliament passed a modern slavery act some years ago, which gave us some a reason to be talking about this with other parliaments. But we're very clear that we need to do that in a sensitive way. And that's partly about terminology and language. Uh, so as an example of that, when we work with uh, in Ghana with African parliaments, there was uh, a strong view that we should avoid the actual terminology around modern slavery. And while that remains the terminology in the act, we decided it was better to use terminology for that discussion around forced labor and human trafficking. So first point, getting the terminology right is key, I think, to moving beyond that dynamic. If you are going to have to teach, get in outside experts who really are, can teach. So that might be on particular points of law. Don't get one set of parliamentarians trying to teach another set of parliamentarians. If it really is expertise, maybe look outside because it's easier to take. And thirdly, to get beyond the teacher-student dynamic, make it circular. Uh, make it learning from each other. Josua has already referred to that, I think. Uh, everyone involved in this will have something to learn, even if the balance is maybe different at the beginning. Uh, so as you see there, an example of a quote from the Australian Parliament, what they've taken from some of our work together. Actually, it was just as key, Australia there thanking the UK for what they learned. But then since that, it has been us learning from them uh, and taking some work that they've been doing around what sometimes gets called orphanage trafficking. So circular learning, making sure everyone has something to learn. And if you see from that from the next slide, that that's just an example of where uh, we have tried to create networks so that people from, including the UK, but from a region are learning from each other. So the, second, the next topic uh, to cover on the next slide is around how you share knowledge across different systems. We all have very different systems. The Commonwealth, uh, while has some similarities, that's still very true. Uh, the, and for public accounts committees, the example I've chosen here, again, that was particularly true. Public accounts committees are dealing at different levels of scale, the scope of what they are allowed to investigate, the, the systems they're working in, the sophistication of their, their legislature. So what we've done is focus on what is shared and what is not different. Every public accounts committee or public finance scrutiny is trying to get good answers to good questions. So we focus on that. Every public accounts committee or equivalent uh, works better as a team. So focus on what does that team work actually look like? Most public accounts committees want to have some kind of a effect with the public and interchange with the public wherever they are. So focus on how do you do that? How do you learn from each other on that? And by focusing on those commonalities, that is where we feel we've had some learning. I'll come back to showing some of the evidence for that in a moment. But if we look at the just those quick images on the next slide, um, here are two ways we do that. On the left, you can see uh, the portal, which we've created as part of the Commonwealth Association of Public Accounts Committees, uh, which is a portal for sharing knowledge and experience, open to all on that, whatever system you're in. And there's an example, I think we have a colleague online from Malaysia, but of a, a committee exercise we did in Malaysia, which again, uh, tried to, uh, address some of those common themes, common challenges, uh, regardless of what system you're operating in. The final theme I wanted to cover briefly uh, on the next slide is around the topic that was mentioned about effectively integrating between elected officials and parliamentary administration. So the elected and the, the officials and the staff, if you will. We do a lot of work with the UK's overseas territories and their legislatures. The public financial management and public financial scrutiny, which is what we focus on there, is a collaborative exercise between the elected, between officials of parliament, between auditors. So the learning should be collaborative. It may sound obvious, but that's what we've tried to mirror. We've put together a consortium at the UK end with our National Audit Office and our Internal Audit Agency, and we work with them and people in parliament to devise a consortium and to work with their counterparts in the overseas territories. So it's to mirror that collaboration that effective, that effective integration uh, in the learning so that it actually happens uh, in the practice. And that's what we've tried to do. So if I can go to the next slide there, 
what I what I would add uh, on that slide is that yes, it brings people together. So the committee exercise you can see there does bring together elected and unelected officials and auditors, uh, and and you, that's the group on the right. But we also provide, as it were, a safe space. People need a safe space so they can just talk as elected members, and they can just talk uh, as auditors, or they can just talk as officials. I think that's important too. Finally, and I'm uh, over my six minutes already, so apologies. Um, just wanted to say something on. Uh, uh, on assessing and measuring impact, which is also mentioned. I think we all we do at CPA UK what many of you will do in fairly conventional uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation, but we've tried to keep stretching that. One way is to recruit temporarily through our Parliament's uh, Office of Science and Technology, a, an academic fellow who has been attached to it, academic fellows who've been attached to our work, looking at specific areas to look in more depth at the impact of our, our work, both on modern slavery uh, and also our work uh, with the Parliament of the Gambia. Uh, and then also, uh, we have been trying to be longitudinal, I suppose, in our approach. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, some examples of how we've tried to use principles around the uh, Public Accounts Committee work. You won't be able to read the detail, but at the bottom of the screen, that's the various principles that have been agreed for a successful Public Accounts Committee. And then both looking across regions, the different profiles, uh, of where those principles would be more or less met according to the regions themselves and shaping our work accordingly. And then on the next slide, you'll see an evolution over time. So if we went back and looked at those benchmarks two years later, how they felt they were doing against those principles, had there been movement against them? So again, slightly stretching the conventional tools as to how we're doing uh, measuring impact. That's closer to the eight minutes I was first given than the six minutes I was told to shorten it to. I'm sorry, but I hope that's of some use. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, John. That that was great, and you did uh, you did keep to the time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just want to um, draw everyone's attention to the chat box where we have put a couple of polling questions uh, that uh, would love you to to respond to. Um, and we'll we'll come to those questions in a bit. And also, if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to uh, to mention them here as well, um, and we will make sure to address them uh, throughout the, the session. Um, so once again, thank you so much, John. Um, we will have the chance to discuss much more in detail in our breakout sessions, um, and we'll come back to uh, to your um, presentation and comments comments at that time. So thank you. Um, I would like to give the floor now to uh, to Dalila um, Molide. I hope I'm mentioning that right. Um, Dalila has been with the Assemblea da Repubblica, uh, the Portuguese Parliament, since 2007, um, and she currently heads the International Relations and Cooperation Division. Um, and we are delighted to have her here with us today, uh, talking to us a bit more about the experience of the Portuguese speaking community, community uh, through a multi parliament approach. Delila, thank you so much. You have the floor. It's my pleasure to be here and to address you. I will try to share my slides. I hope it's working. Networks not. I think that my network's not perfect, so it may it may be a bit slower than <laughs> than I would rather have it. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've uh, also I've already um, learned a lot from uh, my my previous uh, colleagues who spoke. So I'm uh, very happy happy to be a part of this panel. Since I don't have a lot of time, I'll go straight into uh, my presentation uh, to tell you that um, in the Portuguese parliament, uh, the parliamentary strengthening activities, parliamentary development is seen as a core mission. Um, uh, it, this, um, it, it would be easier to say this if there were incentives to uh, members of staff and members of parliament who, who took part at these uh, activities, which there aren't. But um, it is strongly recommended and uh, we, in, in our training programs for staff since, since the very beginning, we try to incept the idea that um, this is a, a, a mission and that all uh, parliamentary staff should devote some time to these kind of activities. Um, because the parliamentary uh, agenda is very heavy, 
and resources are limited. There is um, an orientation uh, to focus on priority countries and priority countries are those who align with the with the, the priorities defined by one, by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course. So um, we focus mainly on countries um, that are close to the European Union or that, that are trying to um, to become a member of the European Union, to uh, to countries who are our neighbor, like Morocco and the, the and the northern African countries, and of course the Portuguese speaking countries. I I would tell not mathematically, but from experience that 80% um, of our activities in this area uh, focus on uh, Portuguese speaking countries. Most of our uh, activities um, are uh, framed by bilateral programs between the Portuguese parliament and the parliaments of these uh, Portuguese uh, speaking countries, which are composed of uh, mostly short and midterm activities. There have been in the past uh, some uh, more longer term cooperations, but because those involved um, uh, prolonged stays of our staff in abroad, those were discontinued because lately we have uh, had some um, um, scarcity of human resources and difficulty um, hiring new resources. So these longer term programs have to be um, discontinued. Um, I would say uh, a lot of what I've uh, heard um, from um, Joshua um, is uh, common to what we feel um, in terms of uh, challenges that are, of course, the lack of resources, or at least they are not unlimited, they have um, uh, some limitation. Some pro problems uh, um, in what concerns infrastructure uh, at the level of the parliaments that are being supported. Um, there are um, strong necessities in terms of IT development in which many of our activities uh, are um, dependent. There's also a problem of sustainability. For, in, in sustainability, I mean that we have, we face um, sometimes um, the politicization of parliaments, uh, meaning that uh, a lot of the staff is not uh, very permanent. And as you know, obviously, MPs uh, are constantly changing. So sometimes we feel that uh, our actions do not endure in time. Uh, there's also the problem uh, um, that these constant changes in uh, politics uh, sometimes determine changes in uh, at the top of the administration level, uh, which determine different priorities. So we start a program. And then a new secretary general at the supported parliament comes and determines that that is not a priority or that an, another route should be taken. Um, so that is a, a, a big problem too. Uh, on, on the issue of sustainability on resources, there's also the problem of uh, sometimes, um, which is not a problem, it's more, more of a challenge of uh, overlapping. Uh, we feel uh, at several levels that we don't have enough information about uh, what other parliaments and what donor agencies are doing in, in supported parliaments. And sometimes there is overlapping. And sometimes there, I, 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 we feel that donor agencies would uh, benefit from the knowledge of uh, other parliaments, which uh, know um, uh, very well parliaments and can help with their expertise and uh, maybe help in directing uh, the resources to better ends. And we do feel that um, as uh, polls uh, um, a minute, some minutes ago, um, it is not easy to involve uh, members of parliament uh, in this kind of activities. On our side, Portuguese MPs uh, have been participating a lot, even in the past two years, um, where we had to focus on uh, mostly on video conferences. They were very happy to participate. They, they took part in, uh, in more activities than before even. I think that, that was more compatible with, the, with their agendas. But we do feel that, on the other hand, there is this um, big problem of um, teacher-student um, stigma, and sometimes members of parliament in the uh, in the, the supported countries are not uh, available to be to be part of these programs. 
Um, talking about specifically the, the multi-parliament approach, I would like to speak about two different uh, um, activities that we in which we take part. One of them is the Associations, uh, Association of Secretaries General of Portuguese-speaking parliaments. It's a, an association that has been created in 1998 by the Secretaries General of uh, all of the Portuguese-speaking parliaments. Um, they have been working mainly uh, with the goal of exchanging information and um, best practice at all levels of, of administration. And so um, most of the activities involve um, uh, the organization of uh, seminaries of information for staff for uh, specific areas of knowledge in the parliament. Um, sec all secretaries general also meet annually to discuss um, uh, priorities and areas of uh, mutual support. And sometimes when there is uh, when we feel that there is a need um, across the, the the country, all of the countries uh, of uh, a need to develop a specific issue, we also approach um, approach these activities in as a multi parliamentary in a multi parliamentary way. I, I took uh, um, the liberty of choosing this case study of a project that is currently running, um, that is a project to develop a collective catalog for the libraries of the Portuguese uh, speaking parliaments. We support, um, we, we were supporting um, the, the databases of several parliaments of Portuguese speaking parliaments. And we, uh, we, a lot of the Portuguese speaking parliaments came to us telling that the databases were old, were not supporting their activities, the, the previous uh, contractors uh, were discontinuing the development and the, uh, and the upgrade of the basis. So they, 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 they need to, they, need, they felt the need to find another tool to, to have their, um, their libraries catalog. So because of that, we, felt, we thought that we couldn't find, um, uh, it, it wouldn't be um, useful to find uh, um, um, different solutions for each parliament. It would be better that we could find um, a global solution that would fit all of the parliaments. And we talked to, to the contractor who provides the, um, the service to our library, and he developed uh, a solution, a very light solution, which is um, uh, hosted in the cloud. So it, in terms of technology, uh, it doesn't have a lot of requirements, but allows for the interconnection of all of the databases, which means that a, a user um, um, searching at the database of the Portuguese parliament will be able to search at all of the databases in, in, in the libraries of the Portuguese speaking countries. So um, which uh, will make, um, more documents and more books available to a wider uh, range of um, of people. Uh, this is um, a, a project that has already uh, some months, but it is still in in the, in the beginning. So um, it, it it will take a, it will take some time to implement because it will also depend on some sort of um, common uh, common ways of cataloging books and magazines. So uh, it, it's also depend, it's, it's depending on technology and also um, training for the human resources that uh, are uh, on these uh, on the libraries that will be part of the project. And but we expect it to to be very useful and very um, uh, also make it very available for a, for a wide range of people because in 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 these countries in most, many of these countries. The, the libraries offered the the, the the libraries offered by the parliaments are one of the best libraries um, available. So uh, I think it will be a, a good tool for uh, more than uh, the the parliamentary community, also the the civil society community in general. And um, this is what I wanted to share with you today. I will obviously be open to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Talila. Um, that's it's great to hear more about the um, experience of the Portuguese speaking community, and I'm sure we'll have the chance in the breakout sessions to discuss in a bit more detail um, about uh, the challenges you shared, but also about some of the solutions that you found um, to those challenges. Um, 
we um, would like to move on to our next uh, speaker for today. Um, and uh, I would like to pass the floor now to uh, Michael uh, Mukuka, uh, ICT Director at the Parliament of Zambia. Um, uh, Michael has been with the Parliament of Zambia for uh, 18 years and became instrumental in establishing the ICT department um, at the National Assembly there. He also coordinates the IPU Center for Innovation in Parliament Southern African Hub, as you can all see um, on the screen uh, of the presentation. And in this capacity, he will share more with us today about the work of the hub. Um, Michael, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ingrid. Thanks very much, everyone who is attending this meeting. I hope I can be heard, um, being heard. Uh, can we move to the next slide since introduction has been done? So I'll try and cover the introduction to the, the hub, the Southern Africa hub, um, how it works, the key strengths, the achievements, challenges, and the way forward. We move on to the next one. Okay, so the Southern African hub is basically a subgroup under uh, IPUCIP Center for Innovations in Parliament. That was launched on the 5th of um, December 2018 in Geneva during the World E Parliament Conference that took place. And that's when with the Southern, Southern Africa Hub was launched, as you can see from that picture. And the members of the Southern African um, ICT Hub comprise all the member parliaments that are within the SADC region. And so we had our first meeting uh, for the hub uh, in basically March, 2019. That's when we held our first meeting to do the planning for the hub. So uh, we start working together and uh, doing some collaboration and engagement in various aspects. So we move forward to look at the structure. Let's move forward. Okay, so the organization overview or structure, you have the IPU and then you have CIP, then you have thematic and regional hubs, which are dotted across the global. And Southern Africa happens to be a regional hub instead of thematic, though we also feed into the thematic hubs in case we need certain things to be done. So on the Southern African hub, we have the clerks uh, or the secretary generals being the main board or maybe the board of directors, so to say. And then we have the hub coordinator and the ICT directors are the ones that are coordinating various activities in the various parliaments. Then the bedrock of this is basically the team of uh, technical experts. These are the guys, this, this is the team that is undertaking various solution, coming up with various solutions to the challenges that we keep facing. Can we move forward? How does it work? So the IPUCIP coordinates activities with hubs. Basically, they don't come up with any solution for us. As a hub, we come up with our own solution. For instance, the regional hub, like my, uh, our, our, our regional hub initiates all the the, we, initiate this, we initiate the projects or the activities that we want to be undertaken. So one of the meetings that we had when we, we started the hub was basically to initiate various projects. We look at what is happening in all our parliaments to see where the gaps lie and we initiate activities to try and close up those gaps. So the hub itself now coordinates those activities after the regional direct, the, the various ICT directors in these parliaments have come up with the work plan. So the request is now sent when a particular parliament has an issue to be dealt with and they don't have the resources, they would send the request to the hub and then the hub informs CIP, they simply informed in case we need coordination and to tap into other thematic or regional hubs that have come up with that particular solution. So this is why we involve CIP to make sure that they help us coordinate in case we need to tap into further resources 
uh, we cannot get uh, within our region. So how do we do it? We come up with a number of webinars from time to time. We have these webinars taking place. Of course, we, we try and use WhatsApp as much as possible. Why? Just for the sake of coordinating and talking to each other, it's fast and easy for us. And we also have in-person meetings that we hold, like the one I just showed you uh, in the, when, when we started. These are important for us to network and get to know each other and understand the various challenges that our parliaments are facing. We move on. The key strength, the latest support from, for instance, from this end, you needed to get the support from the management of the National Assembly, as well as key stakeholders within the region. So we have that support from the National Assembly of Zambia, as well as from the government of the Republic of Zambia, we also get a lot of support from SADC PF, SADC Parliamentary Forum, which is a mother body for all parliaments within our region, and also from the Southern, South, uh, South African Parliament. And another strength that we have is that we have a lot of similarities within the region in the way we conduct parliamentary business. We are quite similar. So we say we are the people of one language and because we are the people of one language, it is easy for us to work together and coordinate various issues that we, we need to coordinate, look at the gaps that we have and try and close those gaps. The ICT, the, the hub was, the National Assembly of Zambia was chosen to host the hub. One of the main issues was that it has a very strong and well-established ICT department so it has been easy to drive the activities of the hub because of the way it is established. There are very few parliaments that are well established in terms of ICT departments. So it becomes a challenge if they were given, it was going to be a challenge if they were given an opportunity to drive it, this. What, I, what else do we have as our key strength is the IPU, CIP support. Like I said, we get a lot of coordination on various aspects. In, in fact, when, for instance, um, a, member, a member has a problem or a challenge that needs to be looked at, the CIP sometimes coordinates, looks at the country that has developed a particular solution. So CIP connects that particular parliament or that particular country to another parliament or country where this solution has been developed and is working well. So we have that goodwill. All right, what are some of our achievements that we've, uh, we've scored so far? Um, we had a mission to the, to the parliament of Botswana from the members, went there to try and help them come up with the RCT strategy. We've had a lot of collaboration regarding some of the systems that we've developed during the pandemic. For instance, the Zambian parliament has developed a system called e-chamber that manages the, um, the seatings of the house. It manages the, the plenary assembly, the activities of the plenary assembly. And we are collaborating with our colleagues like South African, South, South African Parliament so that they can also improve further on that. Development of hybrid system to mitigate the effect of COVID-19. It was quite easy because we are, we are a team, we are a group, uh, we, are, um, we, we are better positioned, positioned to deal with issues simply because we have a, a pool of resources that each of the countries have and we put together, uh, we tap into that. Development of hybrid um, meetings, a quick guide. So as a hub, we've also developed what we call the quick guide on hybrid, hybrid meetings. We have worked with CIP to make sure that that is uh, done. Development of each chamber application. We've got this application like I've indicated and a number of our colleagues are looking forward to using it. And one of them is Malawan parliament and many other parliaments that have not yet developed an application that will also allow for remote voting, remote participation in the house. You know, we have of course, used, we use things like Zoom, applications like Zoom, but you see they're very limited in the way they operate. Next. Sorry, Michael, just wanted to also highlight that we're running a bit short in this session. So um, okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just about to finish now. 
Thank what you. are the lessons learned? We, may, we need to make sure that we keep the technology as simple as possible. International knowledge exchange. This has been created by CIP. So we have a pool of resources internationally. Strengthen of ICT infrastructures. So these are some of the lessons we've learned. If you don't have a strong ICT infrastructure, it becomes a problem. Next. Okay, the challenges. The South African Campus is not full time job. So it's not a full time job for me. I've got a lot of, a lot of other responsibilities to do. So basically that is a challenge. Lack of ICT capacity in most parliaments becomes a challenge, dedicated human resource needed, availability of resources for capacity building and availability of resources for exchange or study visits or benchmarking. Next, thank you very much. Question and, questions and answers. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, and um, sorry, I had to uh, cut you a bit short. I didn't realize um, that, uh, you know, the, the session with, uh, with Overrun. Uh, but uh, we will take a bit of time for our uh, last uh, case study uh, before we move into the uh, sort of the networking session, which I'm sure we're all very much looking forward to. Um, and our um, next presenter and final presenter for today is Martin Kuta, who's the head of the General Analysis uh, Department of the Czech Parliamentary Institute at the Czech Chamber of Deputies. Um, and he's also responsible for interparliamentary co development cooperation at the Chamber of Deputies. And will talk to us a bit today um, or start the debate around incentive mechanisms for staff engaging in peer-to-peer -peer parliamentary strengthening. Thank you so much, Martin. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sincerely sorry for being a bit late in this panel. Uh, I will start sharing my presentation um, shortly. And um, yes, so I hope you can see my presentation. Thank you, Ingrid, for, for uh, introducing me. Um, as Ingrid said, uh, my, my name is Martin Kuta. I work uh, with the Parliamentary Institute of the Czech Chamber of Deputies. Um, the Parliamentary Institute itself, it's a, uh, it's a research unit within the Czech Chamber of Deputies, which provides in-house uh, scientific research, informative and educational service. But except for these uh, main tasks, we also uh, cover all the interparliamentary development cooperation uh, for the sake of the Czech uh, Parliament of the Czech uh, Chamber of Deputies. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I'd like to share with you some of our experience with the peer-to-peer -peer project. Um, the Czech Republic, as a newcomer to the European Union, uh, has been a recipient of uh, many of um, development uh, um, institutional development cooperation in the pre in, in the times after 1989 actually i was late because of today's it's a public holiday here in the czech republic uh, celebrating the fall of the communism on the november uh, of the 17th of 1989 and since the the very beginning of uh, the freedom uh, period in the czech uh, recent history we've received we have received a lot of international development um, cooperation projects and help. From this perspective, we feel very strong in um, that we actually know how to move forward, how to improve our internal capacities, how to uh, how to uh, foster these internal inter internal capacities, and we are uh, we feel also a bit obliged to the international community that we have to pay it back. Uh, so that's the reason why we actually engaged in a lot of uh, research projects and uh, in a lot of uh, development projects. Uh, in the recent period, we have been, or our experts have been engaged in two uh, main uh, twinning projects in the area of Balkan, uh, West Balkan, uh, Western Balkan countries and the countries of the East uh, Europe region. Uh, one of them was uh, the twinning project in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was aimed at strengthening uh, of parliamentary capacities vis-a-vis -vis the um, EU approximation process uh, in between 2019 and 2021. And the second main project was uh, the twinning project with the same actually goal um, in Republic of Moldova in between 2017 and 2019. Um, all these projects have in common that these projects aim at um, 
increasing or enhancing internal capacities and internal knowledge of parliamentary staff uh, with regard to EU ACI, EU approximation, EU legal approximation process, EU harmonization or legal harmonization with EU uh, legal system, with EU ACI and EU policies. It actually uh, means that in these projects, we apply the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, approach in um, collaboration and, and cooperation with uh, the parliamentary staff in the respective parliaments. And uh, the, the cooperation included the peer-to-peer the, the, the -peer, uh, mm, cooperation at the very, uh, at one piece of legislation, um, going paragraph by paragraph, if the draft law, the governmental draft law, which was actually put forward to the parliament, actually um, is aligned with the, 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 the former or the previous EU Aki uh, example. It's very technical, uh, very uh, experti expertise. Uh, it's very uh, necessary that the, that the cooperation is aimed at the very core of the EU law and the, the harmonization process. Therefore, it's necessary to motivate people, motivate real experts from uh, national parliaments to take part in these projects uh, and to provide them some, 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 kind of, some kind of motivation, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, incentive. Um, when I was thinking of, the, of my uh, contribution topic, uh, the the mechanism for uh, sorry uh, the mechanism for P2P activities uh, could be uh, divided into two uh, subgroups. The first one there is an definitely an economic incentive. You simply pay uh, for the consultancy. You simply pay the peers for the, the for uh, their time for their work uh, that they actually go in the country. They actually cooperate uh, with the parliamentary staff. Uh, in the beneficiary country, and they actually do the, the substantive work. But of course, there might be some non-economic incentives. And I would like to uh, focus my presentation on these non-economic incentives. Um, in these non-economic incentives, I'd like to distinguish between two, uh, two big advantages. One of them is the individual advantage of these non-economic incentives, or what these non-economic incentives actually bring to uh, an individual expert. And the second one, uh, the second big part or big advantage is the institution, what it actually brings to uh, the institution that is, that is actually um, responsible for uh, the uh, peer to peer uh, engagement. There is a list of five, uh, or perhaps there might be much more incentives, but I was uh, thinking of these five uh, incentives uh, tourism, networking, experience, gain, self assurance, and landscape monitor. The first one is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, tourism. It's pretty clear what I mean here. It's an informal perk, uh, actually beyond ordinary job duties, that the experts actually travel to the beneficiary country, uh, have the have the opportunity to to uh, walk around the parliament, have the opportunity to uh, to taste the country, uh, to to understand the people. Um, it's actually an individual incentive. Uh, but that, not, that might be not necessarily useless. Uh, it can actually uh, brought more understanding, or more, it can bring uh, understanding uh, of that country, uh, of what are the, the, the real problems, how the people feel about some uh, international, international development, for instance, if they are actually uh, aware of what the EU approximation or of the EU integration process means. And uh, this can definitely uh, bring mutual trust in between the institutions and the individuals. Of course, uh, in the period of, uh, for, from March 2020, um, this is a big a, a kind of problem uh, because of uh, the, uh, virtual, uh, uh, the virtual organization of uh, such, uh, such uh, activities. The Sorry, Martin. One, Sorry, just to, to draw your attention that we have just a couple of minutes left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, Thank I'm you. going to, to, to go with uh, very uh, quickly. The second uh, incentive might be the networking. Uh, when two peers uh, actually uh, meet, they can discuss, uh, they can discuss the, the, substantive, uh, the substantive matters. 
um, they can build a net of contacts in parliament. Um, all the parliamentary practitioners are actually aware of the of the ECPRD network. Uh, this can actually help people uh, to to uh, look for uh, information more quickly, uh, and actually can, it can contribute to existing uh, net networks of contacts uh, in the in the parliament. So that's definitely a very useful uh, kind of incentive that will uh, definitely bring uh, that will definitely bring fruit uh, to uh, both the beneficiary institution and the and the and the institution from which the, the experts come the third um, incentive might be very individual and it's actually the experience gain in the when when we look to the twinning manual uh, there is a requirement on uh, how to uh, there are requirements on how long an an expert uh, have to be uh, employed uh, within the parliament to take part actually in the twinning projects and uh, some of the peer-to-peer -peer activities can actually help to gain the experience which uh, actually is then necessarily needed uh, for the engagement in the in the twinning uh, project or in other projects where the, the age of uh, the um, um, the expert is uh, actually a formal uh, requirement then I was thinking on a, on a, of a very individual incentive, and that's actually the self-assurance. When I actually have to sort uh, the stuff what I'm actually doing uh, in my office and to try to explain it to my peers and my colleagues in beneficiary parliament or beneficiary institution, then I have to think of whether, I am doing, whether I'm doing it in the right way, if there is anything um, possible for improvement, and if uh, this is actually... Uh, this is actually a very good opportunity to, to self-assure that I am doing the, the very good job uh, at my own institution. I can discuss it with my colleague and I can uh, perhaps, um, perhaps uh, improve it. And then uh, the last one, it's perhaps the, uh, an institutional incentive. It's actually the landscape monitoring, as I call it. Uh, it's an advantage that, uh, for instance, a parliament, which is thinking of uh, engaging in a twinning project, may actually uh, monitor the, the level of knowledge, the level of skill uh, in the, uh, between the parliamentary staff uh, in, the, uh, in the parliament uh, in which the twinning project might be possibly uh, implemented in the future. And it actually can uh, help to evaluate the state of the art and to draft the twinning uh, bit in a better way. So I was thinking also about how to, how to combine all these, uh, all these incentives together. Um, there's definitely necessary a managerial or perhaps strategic uh, support to P2P activities in which uh, the combination of non-economic and economic incentives is necessary. Um, and I also think that uh, these incentives might be reflected by international actors, be it donors or be it the actors that actually implement the international cooperation uh, project uh, aimed at the parliament. Thank you very much. And I am uh, really very uh, looking forward to um, and discuss the uh, the issue in the breakout session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, and uh, thank you so much to all our uh, really fantastic speakers. And we look forward to the discussions that will come in just shortly after our networking. I will now pass the floor uh, to Jochen and to my colleague Julia to uh, guide us through the next steps. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all those very interesting presentations, which uh, took a little time of our speed dating. So um, we have only a shorter period of 15 minutes left. And uh, first of all, you do have to grab your real coffee because a break is a break. But secondly, we want you to involve in speed dating. That means you'll randomly meet people to talk to for three minimum minutes maximum. Um, and um, the longer you stay in the hop-in, the more people you can meet, maybe old colleagues or new acquaintances. Um, I would say I pass the word on to Julia for uh, technical explanations. Thank you very much, Jochen. Let me 
try to very quickly explain a few hopping rules. Uh, so the first thing is that you will now receive a link uh, to the networking activity. Before you go through that link, please switch off your camera and mute yourself on Zoom meetings, but do not leave the Zoom meeting. We'll be happy to welcome you in some 15 or 20 minutes back here. Uh, you can join the hopping networking activity either by pre-registering or as a guest. If you decide to continue as a guest, which is a quicker way, you will receive an email to confirm your registration. So when you get to the networking event space, uh, you can start networking by choosing, by choosing this networking area and then by clicking to the button join. You will, as Johan has already mentioned, you will have three minutes per session. You can extend that time, but given that we don't have a lot of time for networking, maybe uh, you can meet more people if you don't extend. Thanks very much. I hope this was helpful. Some of us are back from the coffee break. Hopefully the rest will come to join us again. I hope you enjoyed this uh, speed dating experience in case you didn't know, and know it beforehand. Um, we are now starting with the second part of our experience. And this is preparing breakout rooms. Um, in order to give our team some time to assign all of you to the different breakout rooms, I would like to have a look at the results of all our Mentimeter pollings, which should be shared on the screen. And then we can have a look together about the results. So. I have to continue talking until we get yeah. some. Yeah. Sorry for jumping in. I will share the results. Perfect. Um, so as you can see, every time you try out a technique, um, we must practice too. So the first one, the icebreaker, uh, did break the ice in the beginning. As you can see, we have a Focus on Europe, this is not astonishing, but uh, it's good to see that we have uh, all other continents as well. I think Fiji isn't put on the map, but we all know that our colleague was here. So this was yeah, the beginning. Next slide would be the word cloud. As we can see, there's a lot of um, different ideas you have brought up and it would merit uh, reflection in detail what we actually can do with all those ideas. What we propose to do is that uh, Julia and her colleagues in the back have a deeper look at it and decide which topics actually popped up most of the time and might be the most relevant. And then we will ask all of you to make your personal choice in terms of ranking so that at the end of our session, we'll have the top three or top five, I'm not entirely sure, of the most important topics for the participants of this session today. Um, yeah, so we'll see that a little bit later on. Then student-teacher dynamic, can it be completely avoided? There's a clear majority thinking that um, it's a nice idea to aim to do that, but in the end, we will still be stuck with some sort of student-teacher dynamic. We'll discuss this in depth in one of the breakout rooms and maybe uh, talk about those, this answer and uh, your, topic, uh, your opinions later on. So um, parliamentary strengthening work is only effective if we have MPs and staff, and here we see a clear majority of 3.8, which makes sense, I think, personally. This, once again, will be discussed in one of the breakout rooms and uh, in the general discussion then later on. Then we have multilateral parliamentary strengthening approaches. Um, here, it's quite in the middle. Obviously, we have um, many people here who think that bilateral formats are valuable too. Um, 
since we had several presentations talking about this and we have both aspects, multilateral parliaments um, giving the support and receiving the support, it's maybe worth being taken up in the general discussion. Then measuring, measuring and uh, clear outcomes. Um, here, everybody is agreeing. That's a good point. Uh, sometimes, well, uh, we know for donors, it's absolutely key. Implementers must measure. If parliaments are working alone, it's not that important, but we see that in terms of efficiency and outcome, we are agreeing. So here we have a clear response. So the last one, I think, um, external expertise can never substitute peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's also quite clear 3.8, but not that clear. So from a parliamentary perspective, of course, uh, we would go for 5.0, but this uh, remains to be discussed during the next minutes in the breakout rooms and uh, the general discussion. So I hope that in the meantime, everybody has been assigned to one of the rooms. Julia? I think so. Maybe I can just quickly run through, through some basics uh, regarding the breakout rooms, and then you can continue in the rooms. Uh, so you will, all of us will be randomly allocated to a breakout room. We will have access to control similar to the meeting. We can mute, unmute, switch on and switch off our video, send messages in chat. Uh, during the breakout room discussion, uh, facilitators will, will use Jamboard, Google Jamboard. The link to, the, uh, to your Jamboard will be shared by a facilitator uh, in the chat in the breakout room. Please note that you, don't, you do not need a Google account to use Google Jamboard. And uh, in a period of 30, 40 minutes, you will be automatically brought back to the main room. In case you have any technical issues, you can either send a message in chat or ask for help, and it will notify the meeting host that you need assistance and they will be asked to join the breakout room. I wish you all a great discussion this year Thank and you. all of the colleagues. Welcome back. Perfect. Then I would say, Ingrid, it's your turn. Hi, everyone. Well, welcome back. Um, as the um, moderators of your um, groups have indicated, um, I hope you have all chosen uh, a rapporteur uh, to sort of report back to the group from the discussions. We actually, in our group, we didn't get to that point. Uh, the, the discussion had, uh, the, the room had closed uh, before we were able to do so. Um, but uh, hopefully someone will, will uh, take on that, uh, uh, that role uh, when we get to breakout room four. Uh, but in the meantime, we're really uh, keen to hear what happened in the other breakout rooms and um, to hear more about the discussions um, and uh, how you made use of the Jamboards as well. So um, perhaps I could um, pass the floor on to the rapporteur for breakout room one uh, to share with us uh, a quick summary of the discussion. For our room is Fortis. Uh, I just oh, this, this is one. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, all right. Um, maybe we should uh, put on screen the. Um, uh, let me. Shall I do it? Put it on screen. Oh, oh you, I really have, did you, you have it already. All right. Yes. So uh, the, uh, here it's about. All, it's all about student teacher dynamics and. Uh, um, pretty much everyone uh, has identified that uh, maybe the term is not exactly accurate or accurately used um, uh, because most of, um, of us identify that uh, um, it's not really uh, about um, um, uh, teacher to student um, uh, exchange. So from uh, from a, a strong um, expertise to a less uh, to a weakened expertise, uh, it's it's more about uh, being among peers, among uh, equals in the pares, so to say, 
and um, it's a more of a balanced exchange of information uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, there is of course there's of course a setup where uh, there's a sort of a flow uh, in into one direction, but at the same time, uh, it can if done correctly, and I'm underlining this, uh, the the teacher so to say. Uh, should get something back, become um, also involved as a student, uh, learning from 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 the peers. Um, of course, a uh, second uh, thing I identified is there's not always only good practice to be shared. Also, bad practice can be shared, and in some um, occasions, uh, it might be even more important than the. Uh, than the good practice. Now, of course, we get into more discussions here. Uh, is there anything like good practice? What does this mean? Uh, if we do something in Greece correctly, does this mean that in Kuala Lumpur, uh, in Malaysia, that it can be used in the parliament there? Maybe within a certain unified setup like the European Union, maybe, but uh, I wouldn't be so sure as well. So it's it's very much context specific. And the third, to sum it up here, uh, it would be uh, regarding, um, we talked about tools. Uh, it's fine to talk about the learning process, um, but at some point you need to discuss about how this learning process can be facilitated. And the next slide, please. So the second, um, the second board. Uh, was all about these tools, and uh, it was correct uh, done so. Um, and specifically, we um, we discussed uh, exchange about four approaches. Well, not exactly tools, but more of uh, of approaches. Uh, there's the classic teaching approach. Um, some some expert. Let me call this uh, like this. Um, providing information towards some people or group of, group of professionals, parliamentary professionals that need this information. Uh, now, there are positive uh, uh, aspects here. It's something we all know from our life as, as uh, students, as uh, pupils. Uh, but in the 21st century in, uh, and in the pandemics, in the, in the time of the pandemic, it remains uh, if this is um, uh, if this is something that it's really efficient. Then it's uh, it's the coaching thing. It's more of a mentoring approach. Um, it can be expressed through various means and uh, and uh, and setups. But I would say personally, uh, and many people would agree uh, possibly with me, it might be one of the best possible um, methods available. There are problems, though. It's very intensive. If it's one to one, you need for every student, let's say, learner, you need a professional that teaches or, or transmit knowledge. That's very intensive um, compared to other approaches. And it is difficult. Uh, it is difficult because it's very tough to, to be a coach. Uh, most of uh, this is a process that can be learned and hence the train of trainers and, and other other um, approaches that grow a professional into a coach. And then there are more elaborate techniques um, like the simulation. Very interesting. And maybe you can teach a, a group or someone uh, very accurately what you wanted to say because you, you most uh, probably probably have um, you have there are also visual audio visual tools to um, uh, that are employed and practical examples but it's very tough to get it right and it, it requests lots of time for the trainer to develop this material and then it's very questionable if if this material that is used in one setup can be used again into another remember what we talked about good and bad practice and last um, but not least 
these, uh, there's the action uh, learning, it's what the name says. It's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it can be similar to, to the simulation, but it's, uh, it, it uh, involves uh, practical uh, examples. It, it involves um, hands-on approach, and it needs a lot of time to, uh, for the examples and, uh, and the method to get uh, developed. And at the same time, it's, uh, it's, well, it's, it's expensive. It, require, it requires a lot of resources. Um, what's, uh, what's the best that would depend, and you would maybe agree with me, each one of these methods uh, has to be evaluated for, um, for a purpose. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm leaving you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Fotis. Um, that's great. Um, and quite a few points there to, to discuss. Um, I will now pass the floor to the rapporteur from the second group. Um, Matthew. Uh, yes, this is Matthew. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I drew the straw, short straw for that one. Um, so I guess, uh, well, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, we were looking at um, the innovative approaches that can be taken. Um, and I guess that for us um, being post in a, in a COVID environment, post COVID delivering parliamentary strengthening and capacity building in those environments, um, inevitably you're going to look at uh, embracing of technology as a, as a key element of that. Um, and we discussed um, a number of different areas. Uh, we looked at utilizing online learning platforms. Um, uh, the CPA has obviously developed a parliamentary academy and there's the Agora portal um, and the IPU are, are now looking at developing that work. Um, so providing um, a platform for, for a fixed training for uh, parliamentarians and clerks. Uh, and that has uh, its positives, but it's also, it has challenges. There is that loss of uh, the personal touch, the social interaction. Um, so it has to be a, a complementary approach taken so that you're providing other formats to engage and to provide learning. Um, and, you know, the, the issue also that was raised was looking at, you know, the webinar fatigue um, and will webinars continue to be the, the best platform to deliver parliamentary strengthening work uh, in the short term? Will people want to go back desperately to traveling and face-to-face and -face engagement? But then of course, we've just had COP where uh, international travel is perhaps not the, the popular approach to take any longer. Um, so how are we base, uh, basically going to be able to utilize these systems? Um, and linked to that um, was one another issue that was um, Another approach that was proposed was looking at the models that were discussed in the presentations earlier, looking at the, the regional hub approach and the, and the localized approach, the sort of global south approach um, to uh, providing training, providing avenues of support and capacity building, um, and also the, the floating um, budget office in the Pacific is another example of that and how um, more of a localized approach can also be of, of benefit and can provide a more nuanced um, uh, way of sharing information that's more relatable to the recipients. Um, if you're working one Pacific Island with another, uh, there are some uh, similarities in the approaches that are existing and how to um, repeat them um, for domestic um, use. Um, in terms of other ideas and, and approaches that were discussed, um, thanks for going back. Um, we looked, uh, we, we briefly touched upon things like WhatsApp groups, and I know from and personal experience um, that after delivering a very traditional um, seminar, uh, the recipients uh, formed part of a WhatsApp group, and they continue to provide peer-to-peer um, -peer support to one another following that, you know, from everything from how to run a good election campaign to how to deal with a, a particularly challenging uh, legislative matter. So that, that's another kind of platform that can be used in an approach that's quite innovative in terms of, I guess, cutting out the middleman in terms of our organisations for members to engage with one another. Um, there was also things like looking at longer terms of comments, and I guess what that is focusing on is a more long-term engagement with the, with the beneficiaries um, and be able to provide sustainable support um, and embedding learning over a longer period of time. 
and that obviously requires a more commitment in resources and time to do that but that can uh, have a longer term benefits um, we also touched upon um, some other ideas uh, looking at uh, as was mentioned in the previous discussion group uh, avoiding the teacher student approach and how it should be parliaments to parliaments um, we also looked at um, uh, looking at the development of more generic tools um, so the development of resources uh, obviously uh, IPU do a lot of uh, and many of the other organizations represented CPA and uh, Interpares deliver a lot of resources that can be um, used across different parliaments uh, and is another avenue that can be taken uh, for, for beneficiaries to utilize in terms of learning um, and, and undiscover, uh, discovering best practice and trying to implement that domestically. I think those probably that's probably covered all the the issues that were discussed. Thank you so much, Matthew. That's really interesting. Um, it seems like you had a, an excellent discussion in the breakout session. Uh, we still have two breakout rooms to go, but I wanted to open the floor for any immediate questions at this point coming in from um, either the first group, the second group, or any other comments that. Um, that anyone would like to raise at this point in time. Of course, if there are no immediate questions uh, at this point, we can move on to the third group. Um, John. I'm being greedy because I asked a question just as our breakout room was being closed and I'm being slightly unfair to uh, Femke. Um, whether she's prepared to answer it now. It was about coaching because two members of, of two people, two colleagues have spoken about the value of that. I just wonder whether they're able to give um, uh, a little bit more. Uh, uh, and Fotis has talking about, spoken about it as well, but about about just a little bit more on that. I'm, I'm interested to know sort of the, whether they feel it's sort of for the intense input, whether it's worth it for the, uh, the outcome and the impact. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. Shall we proceed with group number three? That would yes, be um, that would be Frida. So you go ahead. I try to share. Excellent. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I've really enjoyed our conversations so far this morning and afternoon, depending on where you are sitting on our map. Um, I'm Frida Arenas from the National Democratic Institute. I am a program director and work on our legislative development programs globally. Um, before coming to NDI, I worked in the US Congress and the Senate specifically for eight years. And so my experience and practice spans um, both the US system and many others um, as I've been able to work globally throughout my course of time with NDI. And that kind of segues me into the discussion that we had, which is sharing knowledge across parliamentary systems, the challenges and opportunities of doing so. Obviously, our world is vast, and in it, um, parliamentary systems are in incredibly nuanced and particular. Um, sorry, I'm just going to turn off my notifications here for my colleagues. Um, but, you know, obviously, for those of us who work in this space, we understand the incredible difference that exists between various parliamentary and legislative systems across the globe. Part of the challenge of networking, especially when you're bringing peers together across different structures, regions, and systems, is how to both contextualize the similarities, but also recognize the differences in being able to advise and um, ad advance reform in different systems. And so first, you know, we talked about um, what are these differences, right? Where do they exist? Where do they overlap? Obviously, what you'll see here, we've broken this up into field, presidential, semi-presidential, the Westminster tradition, continental tradition, and then, you know, opened ourselves up to other um, issues of relevance. 
But um, there's a lot to consider here. And this is a very, very short list. There's, of course, many, many other considerations and nuances and distinctions that we can see um, from these systems. Uh, just a couple of, of highlights here. Obviously, plenary and agenda setting um, you know, is very specific in different systems. The way parliamentary administration is considered, um, some are, are hired by the executive. Some are individual to parliament, depends on the budget, depends on the independence of parliament to maintain their own budget and staffing. Um, legislative oversight of the executive is very specific um, in different systems. The distinction of powers in a transition, the separation of powers wholly um, is separate in different systems. Um, and just pulling out a few from the Westminster tradition, questions with ministers and the prime minister, um, looking at parliamentary service objective, non-partial staff versus partisan um, affiliated staff is different in different systems. The committee structure is different um, in different systems, et cetera. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So after kind of discussing those various differences, we looked into what might we be able to share um, across different systems? How can we do this effectively? Um, I'll point your attention to the left side of the chart. We weren't able to get to the structure so much. Um, we had a really rich discussion and, and weren't able to um, get to all of the questions that we had. But I think, you know, just just kind of thinking about the last slide for a second um, and moving into, you know, good practices for sharing, we kind of got into this discussion on um, when you are supporting parliaments and whether it be through a practitioner standpoint or a peer level um, standpoint, there seems to be this distinction between support and capacity development for the individual versus the institution. So you can have peer engagement between individual members, individual staffs. Uh, you could connect caucuses, party groups. That's connecting at the individual level to build capacity, understanding, and, and the political wherewithal to address or advance reform. Then there's also the larger macro picture of the institution itself, its rules of procedure, its structure, its administration, the ways in which the administration is separated or structured within that entire apparatus, the connection between the legislature and its various other government entities and parts, the institution and the independence of the institution and the capacity of the institution is almost separate. Of course, they're interlinked, um, but we kind of discussed, you know, how can you best support those two elements um, together? So we so you can see here, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, ways to do that. You know, strengthening research services, staff exchanges, MP exchanges, caucus to caucus exchanges, um, engaging with individuals versus the institutional level, um, collaborating, sharing information across and between one another as experts and peers. Um, this, you know, is is kind of why we're here together in this peer to peer, um, you know, interparliamentary cooperation dynamic. Um, moving on to the next and final slide. So again, opportunities and challenges to what we've discussed already. There's a lot of opportunities, there's challenges, but we see, you know, the challenges also as opportunities. I think, you know, whereas interconnectivity can be made possible through technology and it's certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic we've had a heightened sense of connectivity across the globe being able to have conversations like this so easily at the same time you know there's fatigue in that there is this um, richness to maintaining connection between people um, and you know that I think is something that um, we would like to get back to, you know, there's, there's the ability to create new solutions and innovations and networks, um, as we can see here by connecting people across borders. Um, but also, again, that can be um, difficult when you don't have interoperability in the systems that allow you to share and exchange that information and people. Um, 
I think, you know, creating a repository of information would be really beneficial. We have the Agora platform, obviously, Ingrid and I were actually talking about this during our networking group very briefly, but how do you, you know, thinking of the larger theme here of this breakout group, how do you take the incredible nuance and vast expertise and experience, both from the political level and the technical level, and, you know, make sure that you both recognize the nuance and and distinction, but also be able to help one another create context and shared solutions to the challenges that are uniquely faced by legislative institutions globally. I think, you know, understanding and addressing some of the questions we did here is, is a good first step. Thanks. Thank you so much, Frida. That's really, really interesting. Um, I see questions are starting to pop up, pop up in chat, and I really would like us to take some time to to look into those. Um, but before we do that, um, we have one more breakout room um, to share from. Um, and uh, the fourth breakout room was focused on how to integrate peer to peer support between elected officials and parliamentary administrations. Um, and since we didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to really decide on the rapporteur, um, I will take the liberty to, to nominate Jonathan, who was part of our session to just quickly share um, some of our discussion and, uh, and I'll share the Jamboard at the same time. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so I'll just, just wait for you to share the, the screen. I, I have to say I, I'm, I was incredibly impressed by the amount of content uh, that, that the previous three groups managed to get down, uh, particularly the last group. Um, that was, that was a, a whole thesis that you got through in 20 minutes and um, I'm very impressed. Uh, still, I think that we did a pretty good, pretty good job in uh, in Group Four, um, and uh, and I'll just go quickly through through some of the key points. Um, so so actually, so we were looking at um, the inter. We were looking at staff peer to peer support and MP focused exchange, MP peer to peer support, and the interface between the two. Um, we ended up talking mainly, I think, um, about the advantages, the disadvantages, uh, the ways to be effective with MP-focused exchanges. But the, the initial discussion that I think everybody kind of agreed on, we, it, the initial point was that for technical and administrative kinds of activities, then staff to staff cooperation is sufficient and that it's not really beneficial in those cases to involve MPs who aren't, who aren't involved in, in the mechanics of how parliaments function. Um, and then, as I said, we talked a great deal about the characteristics of effective MP focused exchanges. Um, and there were different perspectives. Um, uh, one, I think, important point that was made was that in, is the selection of members of parliament. Um, and although we don't control, often don't control that completely, um, intercultural competence is very important. And I guess that's true both for MPs and for staff. Um, that it's, it's important to involve MPs and staff who are outgoing and able to build relationships with their peers. Um, and again, um, that the ability to listen is really important in selecting participants in exchanges. I guess that that is also the case for staff and for MPs. But of course, we know that, that sometimes MPs are used to speaking and not as used to listening. It's important to find people who have the capacity to hear as well as to uh, give advice. Um, in terms of some of the positives from involving MPs, um, it was emphasized that including elected officials in activities can build confidence of the partner parliament in the program and thus can make the program more effective. Um, also that if we are gonna involve MPs in exchanges, um, it's important that th there should be specific activities. And, and one example that was given was mentorship between chairpersons of committees from, from partner parliaments. And, and um, this allows a focus and an effectiveness 
Um, one of the downsides uh, that was indicated in some exchanges was that sending parliamentarians abroad is some, has sometimes been seen by parliamentarians as an opportunity to travel rather than necessarily an opportunity uh, to make a serious development contribution. And perhaps that um, uh, getting over that issue, this alternatives or opportunities such as specific mentorship uh, activities can help to do that. Um, and just a final point, um, which I think perhaps we, we didn't expand quite as much as we could have done, because um, I suspect most of us have come across this, that when MPs and staff are involved together, staff tend to defer to MPs. Um, and then an additional point that was made that was connected to that was that we also have to understand that the relationship between staff and MPs is different in different parliaments. Again, it comes back to intercultural competence, but it's also that even though perhaps we in, uh, many of us in Western parliaments feel quite open, feel that we can be quite open in front of members of parliament, the relationship between staff and members of parliament can be very, very different in other parliaments. And if we're gonna be effective, we need to understand what those dynamics are. Um, I don't know if I've included everything, um, but that was what I got from the very interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I think uh, you, you touched on all important points there. Um, so indeed, we come now to, uh, to a more open general discussion. Um, I, I would like to come back to also John's point about coaching. I think it was directed specifically to to Femke, but I know, um, but perhaps we can take a few and then um, colleagues can, can take the floor. Uh, and I see David uh, has raised uh, his hand and you have put some questions in the chat, but I was actually going to give you the floor to, to share a bit more uh, on that. So uh, David Hurst, um, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Ingrid. Um, I thought I'd actually um, respond briefly to John's question as well, because um, I think the coaching point is a really interesting one um, and have some personal experience involved in that. So the, the House of Commons had a fairly long-standing, um, I guess you could call it a twinning relationship with the Myanmar parliament, which uh, a lot of the benefits that were seen in that have now obviously um, somewhat been lost with the kind of current political situation in the country. Um, but the, the kind of, the, the modus operandi of that particular intervention um, was essentially first staff led, um, but also very, very clearly geared towards um, a kind of coaching focus. Now, this was only possible um, for this kind of really very exceptional project in that we were able to carve out long term secondments for individuals to be placed in the parliament and to be able to understand the context really, really intimately, and then to spend a lot of time in that parliament. So we were based in the parliament, we were sat alongside the individuals we were working with, and we were supporting them to develop in all sorts of different kind of ways, because we were dealing with a parliament that was very, very, very new. The staff were very, very inexperienced. So um, we can talk as much as we want about getting away from a student teacher uh, kind of relationship, but it was kind of really kind of needed in that particular context. So I, I just wanted to kind of stress the point that it is very labor intensive and not possible in all sorts of kind of different circumstances in which I guess um, the kind of interventions we'd be talking about through the Interparas project and also other projects where you'd be thinking about um, much more shorter term placement. So I think, I guess thinking about some of the the digital options for follow-up and enabling that kind of ongoing communication is possibly a softer version of what that coaching could look like. Um, I was just going to sort of comment on that. I, I, I put those other questions in the chat. They were things that actually kind of cropped up to me as the presentations were going on earlier. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, one of the ones I was quite interested in, um, in the kind of twinning context, I guess, um, is how do you really kind of understand what you need to be delivering as the 
scare quotes, um, donor parliament. Um, a lot of the work that I've been involved with has benefited massively from having in-country staff who are able to work very closely with that parliament. So I just wondered what experiences any other participants on the meeting today have. Um, and then the second one I'm particularly interested in from a kind of selfish perspective, because it's something I'm thinking about presently in my role, is kind of how do you sell this work back to the parliament? So there's lots of people who work here in parliament. And we're hearing, I think Jonathan was saying at the end of that presentation about the kind of risk that it's seen as a jolly to be sending members of parliament overseas. The same goes for sending staff overseas and parliamentary staff have a kind of key core function, which is, you know, if they work on a committee, it's to support the committee. If they work in a research service, it's to answer requests that come from members of parliament. How do you carve out that time? How do you kind of sell that benefit back to your parliament in order to allow people to do that and I think Martin you know makes a really good start on kind of some of those benefits and they chimed with me massively but I don't know whether other people's parliamentary secretariats would also kind of agree with some of those benefits and you know what tactics people have used in that regard thank you Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Um, indeed, um, I wonder if any of our other uh, parliamentary colleagues here uh, would like to um, to answer to some of those uh, really good points that David has made. Um, I see Martin would like to come in, and um, I'm sure he will have uh, some comments on regarding the, the twinning approach as well, uh, and perhaps uh, delving more into the the selling aspect. Um, so, going back to the to the parliamentary secretariat. Um, so Martin, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, I have started uh, writing down the answer to David's uh, question, sorry for uh, uh, sending it pretty early uh, and not uh, sending it properly. Um, back to your question, I will start with uh, what uh, David just asked, uh, how to sell it uh, internally in the, in, in, the, in the parliamentary administration. Um, I think definitely, you definitely need uh, a strong support from the from the highest uh, highest ranks uh, of the parliamentary uh, administration. I have uh, experienced a lot of situations when there, it it wasn't clear that the parliamentary administration can uh, somehow engage in such projects. Uh, however, you have to uh, or um, at least our, our unit, uh, the Parliamentary Institute has developed very uh, strategic thinking of uh, why we need to why we need to support. Then there is the, also the question of political backing. I would say that we uh, usually ask, for instance, the Foreign Affairs Committee, but that there is a political will. That there would be political will to engage uh, in these uh, projects in the specific countries, and uh, it's a question of parliamentary diplomacy, that uh, the, the, the international development project actually open, open the door, open the gate uh, for the uh, MPs uh, to, to travel to these countries, uh, to those countries, to, uh, to foster the, the, the parliamentary diplomatic channels, to foster the actual the relations. Uh, I think it actually bring fruit uh, not even to the parliamentary administration because when you, as I said, when you, when you have to speak about what you're actually doing, then you improve what you're actually doing because you're, you're some something like a varying of uh, what's, what's your task, what's your role. Um, and you can think of any, any improvements uh, in, your, in your activities. But uh, beside that, you're actually uh, helping the, the, the political representation in, in uh, moving in these uh, uh, specific uh, countries. That's, I would also say that's the reason why we are uh, focusing on, or I, I would say that it's a general issue that the parliaments uh, focus on the, on the, on the, on the historically uh, close uh, parliaments or, or close parliaments from, from the historical perspective, political perspective, geographical perspective. And the, the, the second point, which you raised, uh, whether the, the peer-to-peer uh, approach is useful or appreciated in the in the twinning project. In our case, it was very appreciated. Uh, it helped actually trust building between the the donor and the recipient, and it's also the question of uh, that you're not saying something which is eternal. 
something which is very high. Uh, you're very down, uh, down to earth. Uh, you're actually working with your colleagues from the beneficiary uh, parliament on their actual workload. Uh, you're uh, working with them uh, on the, the legislation which is coming to them uh, at the very uh, at, the, at the very specific stage of their parliamentary and perhaps country's development. Um, and uh, the, the point here is to balance uh, how to be more, uh, to balance uh, how specifically you, you work with them on their workload and uh, how you, uh, how, what should be the, the level of general knowledge after the implementation. And here you have to design very carefully, uh, or one have to design. One has to design very carefully uh, the activities, how to mix the the, the specific general uh, specific general approach. But um, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, the peer to peer activities were very very uh, appreciated in any training project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, it, if you have any other questions or remarks, uh, perhaps other colleagues would like to come in to answer some of those questions. Um, I see uh, Eleni, I believe, uh, you'd like to come in. Go ahead. Yes. Um, not much to say after Martin's <laughs> uh, comments. Uh, I just wanted on the, um, the questions uh, from um, uh, David, um, from our experience of the Hellenic Parliament in training projects, I would like to uh, address the question about how do you really realize the needs of uh, the other parliament. Um, from our experience, it's meetings again and meetings and more meetings and more meetings. It's just have to be that the other party has to feel um, friendly, has to feel respected, has to feel familiar in ways that only uh, an in-person conversation actually can make it, uh, can create familiarization and uh, not only create a safe space that we mentioned before, but also being able to read between the lines of what they are asking you. We usually start with presenting either our uh, practices and procedures and the good practices and procedures. And we have an interaction about them presenting their procedures. Um, but Meeting after meeting after meeting, things come up that may not be in the description of a project, may not be highlighted, and we actually uh, just sit together and work in, at the end. And um, that's that. This has been quite quite useful and effective. In, uh, in terms of both sustainability, actually, because um, when you don't have the, you know, the, the losing pride of mentioning how poor your parliament is or how uh, indifferent your, uh, subord your staff is on his work. And, you know, feel free to, be truthful about what your problems are. You can actually uh, work together and make a better procedure uh, uh, using whatever is, whatever is um, at hand, using the rules of procedure, using uh, practices, using everything. It, it has worked, but it needs to be not remote, <laughs> but there, actually, and having a lot of meetings, which is tiring for the experts. It's very tiring. I, I have to say that it's it's extra work, even if it's good money. It's very, very, very tiring. So, <laughs> but effective. Thank you so much, Eleni. Um, just a 
wanted to go back to, to what David was saying earlier as well in terms of the um, evidence uh, as well for twinning and for any peer-to-peer -peer parliamentary strengthening projects. And perhaps um, some, some of you might have some further thoughts on how best to measure impact and perhaps providing, being able to measure impact and concrete results would also make it easier um, to, uh, to sh showcase those results uh, back to your parliament and create incentives for um, staff and even MPs to, to participate. Uh, but I see Frida has, has also has a, a question or a comment. So Frida, uh, you have the floor. Sure, sure. And Ingrid, if you want to pivot on from the last topic and talk about evaluation, we, we certainly can. I have lots of thoughts there, but um, I just wanted to kind of um, build on a couple of the comments that have been made and, and just throw something out there for consideration to this group and for further discussions. But, you know, I think especially in our conversation on looking at the differences between parliamentary systems and the ways in which you can you know learn from one another's experiences both shared and, and distinguished is also thinking about the lexicon that we use and the ways in which we approach um, assistance or exchange you know depending on if you are a practitioner or a donor versus a peer you know, thinking about what it means to say parliamentary strengthening versus parliamentary development, um, thinking about the, you know, notions behind capacity building or, um, you know, how we categorize and um, potentially, you know, compare when, when really, again, it's distinct and no two parliaments are exactly alike. Um, and so I think, you know, bringing in uh, equitable language and diverse language and also recognizing the connotations of the language we use in this field and in this space is something that I know my organization has really been taking a, a hard look on and, and something that we can continue to discuss as we exchange information between and among one another. Um, so I just wanted to raise that and also, you know, as peers or practitioners and donors provide exchange and, and share ideas and information. Um, you know, we've also been trying to look at ways in which, you know, and, and this was a conversation that we kind of entered earlier on the, how do you become the mm -hmm. teacher versus the student? You know, are we training, are we teaching or are we, are we in dialogue? Are we um, creating opportunities that allow parliaments to design their own agency? to build you know, systems in context that work appropriately? Is it localized? Is it locally owned? Um, and what mechanisms can we as leaders in this field do to ensure that these processes are truly um, you know, it brought on and, and incorporated by those that we seek to impact? So I just wanted to throw out those thoughts. Thank you so much, Frida. Um, those are indeed really important points regarding the, the language that we use um, as well. So I wondered if anyone uh, from the group would, uh, would like to comment uh, on any of those points that uh, Frida raised, um, or if you'd like to bring in any other um, issues for our discussion um, as we move towards uh, the closing of the session. I know it was an intensive three hours, um, but if there are any uh, thoughts uh, that you'd like to share um, at this point, please feel free to, to go ahead and do so. Yes, Omar? Um, I see um, Omar Cham, you have uh, your hand raised. Would you like to come in? Don't think we can hear you, unfortunately. Hello? Yes, yeah, sorry. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry if there's a lot of noise. We are currently on a voter education campaign. Um, basically, my contribution is um, around the issue of the youth voices in, the, in strengthening parliament. 
Uh, but I want to first of all thank all the wonderful speakers for their job well done, and of course to Interpari for a wonderful coordination and moderation of the event. Um, one of the things uh, that will have stand in, um, you know, Parliament is the idea of ensuring that youth voices are really reflected in anything that the Parliament does, either um, through inclusive participation or either through consultation. And this can be enhanced through the use of us civil society because at the end of the day, we want to ensure that there is sustainability in whatever that is done and this cannot be um, carried out properly if the activities or projects are focused on uh, the members of parliament and the secretariat or the parliament staff alone without keeping in mind um, the people that would take charge of the parliament in the future it's more or less like investing energy and capacity into the current mps yeah, no, I... and after um, a particular um, cohort is finished it means we'll have to uh, start fresh with the incoming MPs or the new MPs that we we'll have on board. But once we have, um, you know, even the aspiring parliaments, young people that want to become parliamentarians and uh, also women that want to become parliamentarians, if their capacities are built on these issues from the onset, it means once they get themselves into um, parliament, they will be fully prepared to do the required work and to ensure uh, that um, such institution is strong to be able to represent the welfare and the voices of the people. And these are some of the things that our advocacy has been levied around in the Gambia here. And I think um, it will be great if they are amplified and as well um, adopted in um, other countries as well. It plays a great deal uh, because the more people are aware, the more people are able to do things that matter to the people the most. So I know there is um, limited time and we might not be able to dwell on all of those things um, in detail, but I'm very much honored to have been able to take part in this very important discussion. And um, I have a lot to report back to my institution as uh, a take home and as well a lot to reflect on the best practices are just fantastic. And um, I hope to be able to also be in contact with the other collaborators and partners in here, aside uh, in the party, um, because I want to believe with partnership as it appeared on our suggestions, um, a lot of things can be achieved and a lot of best practices and administrative culture will be adopted as well. So thank you um, very much once again. This is Omar Cham, Speaker of the National Youth Parliament of the Gambia. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Omar. Indeed, uh, that's incredibly important um, that uh, youth voices are part of the decision-making processes and engaged uh, in, in with Parliament and in parliamentary strengthening as well. And really, I think all of um, your interventions are basically um, points that we can um, take on and um, further session, sessions can come out out of those. Each of your interventions really merit um, a session and an in-depth discussion uh, on their own. Um, so I hope that you will, will take on uh, uh, the, the call and respond to that and uh, you know, be inspired to organize uh, further sessions um, under the community of practice um, hosted by Agora um, and in collaboration with all uh, partners and um, that are here today uh, and many others as well. So um, thank you all so much uh, from, from my side and from uh, our um, InterParis team. Um, and I would like to now pass to the floor to Jochen for, uh, for the um, wrap up and uh, closing remarks before, uh, before we close today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, Ingrid. Um, I'll try to be brief since we have worked a lot in the last three hours, but uh, maybe you allow me some more minutes to look back at what we were discussing. Um, thank you all for your contributions, of course, the presenters and those working in the breakout rooms. There have been many aspects, many valuable aspects um, that are part of our daily work and that can make our daily work better. Let me just briefly look back at what we have talked about. There were the five presentations and I just grabbed one aspect from each of them. Uh, the presentation on the floating budget office, um, the importance of sharing resources and bring uh, those information you have to as many people as possible. We heard from John, I very much like the wording of circular learning, which of course is key to all our endeavors, um, to concentrate on similarities rather than differences, 
and of course uh, the very important point for us parliaments to keep in mind that measuring and self-assessment is important even if it's uh, difficult to put into practice we will have to do that Dalila was uh, talking about the challenges we all face in our activities in daily work and um, she gave us um, an insight in the multi-party approach where from the side of the, benefit, uh, of the donor parliament uh, the knowledge was brought to several parliaments which is, of course enhances effectivity and effectiveness. Um, when I think about uh, the African hub of uh, the Center for Innovation in Parliament, um, it's been striking to see that we not only have national ownership, which of course everybody wants, but we have uh, self-management here, which is a step further and which is, I think, very important to um, just help those capacities within parliaments uh, to, to work actively. Then finally, Martin was talking about incentives, incentive structures. This is important for everybody who tries to get staff from administrations for uh, parliamentary support projects. And I liked um, the aspect of institutional benefits, which of course are part of the answer to the question how we can sell it within our institutions. institutions. Uh, we must stress those benefits to the institution, not only to the individuals. That was the block of the presentations. Then we had four breakout rooms. Um, I think time was a little bit tight, but still, when I listened to your presentations, I think a lot of valuable aspects have been mentioned and discussed, and I guess there have been many more, which those of us who have not been sitting in those rooms have not been able to hear. Um, from the student teacher session, I keep the wrong terminology, which of course um, is important because the wording of what we are conceptualizing is quite important. So we should maybe continue uh, the debate on, on this point. Um, innovative approaches in this case have been technical approaches. Um, this is a little bit to what we have been trying to highlighting through our session in total. Um, looking across different parliamentary systems, um, this has underlined the importance of tailor-made programs, that uh, you have to keep those differences in mind and that you really have to look at the very parliament you are working with. And finally, uh, the question of staff and MPs. Uh, we've seen that there are different approaches, different realms if you want to, but that in the end, uh, bringing them together is um, absolutely worthwhile. Now, one of the aims of this session had to be good practice in interactivity. Um, I think this was partly successful. Um, of course, you are all invited to uh, fill in the ev evaluation survey. The link has been placed in the chat. Um, and all your feedback is really welcome. Be critical uh, so that the next sessions can be even more lively. Um, overall, I think trying out different instruments has been worthwhile. We will, of course, um, take some lessons here too. In my um, view, we had maybe a little bit too many ideas and not enough time to put everything uh, fairly into practice. So less is more as often in life. And uh, on the other hand, it shows us that um, there is room for more sessions. There is topics, there are topics that need to be debated. And um, I hope that other parliaments uh, will take this up, which brings me to the last polling. We have one result uh, waiting, and if this last slide could be shared, um, this was the question, what is most needed by Parliament, by the community? Um, <clears throat> and we have here five topics, knowledge sharing being first, 
collaboration, funding, personal contact, and digital expertise. Now, this is interesting that digital expertise comes in fifth, but it shows that um, the tool is not everything. Um, it's, I think, quite good to see that uh, the content knowledge sharing actually comes uh, first and everything we are trying here to say and to do about um, the methods of delivering it is instrumental. It's not the end and the purpose. That's maybe one of the points I would take from uh, this slide. And all the rest of you um, can think about uh, whether this is uh, the starting point for next session. Then um, this was the next aim of our session, starting a dialogue among the community of parliaments doing peer-to-peer -peer strengthening. So we would like you to go on on this way in this path and to come up with further sessions, to come up with other topics and to start next sessions. Um, I know that it's uh, sometimes difficult to organize everything, but you are not alone. Um, the Secretariat of Agora is going to help uh, the next volunteers uh, who will come up with uh, session proposals. So uh, please do go ahead, uh, make this not a one-time event, but the starting point of a new session of uh, further events. Um, so this is my closing remark. And once again, thank you very much to everybody, to our presenters, to you who have been active in the discussions. And I know there was not enough time for the discussion we should have had, but still, thank you also for the, for the moderators in the breakout rooms. And last but not least, to the whole InterParis team who did all the preparing, organizing, and the background work, which was so important for making this session happen. Now, only nine minutes late. I'm sorry for that, but I hope it was uh, worth it. Um, we are now really at the end of the session, and uh, I would say all of you have a good evening. Stay safe and healthy, and uh, let's hope that someday in the not too soon future, we can come and see each other in, 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 in uh, presence again, and not only 